Um, okay, we have all rolled. I have questions. Yes, okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so for the study guide that you just send us, I just want to verify because you know how you usually separate lecture, study guide, and then lab? Yeah, it's all combined. <laughs> it's all combined. Yeah, because what I'm looking at, basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm basically using like the lab for like the lab manual for what I actually am going to teach. Um, and then when I lecture, I teach like that for sure, and then a little bit above and beyond that. So what's okay. on the study guide is what we've covered basically, it's basically lab study guide. Yeah. Um, for everything that we covered in lab, because my lectures have been like a combination of lecture and lab material. So anything that's on the study guide, the like the meat and like the bones of the study guide come from the lab manual, and anything above and beyond that in terms of like like we, and I have, like, I've been combining it. So when I talk about a structure, which would be kind of a lab thing, I also talk about the function, which is kind of the lecture thing. So I just kind of put them together. Um, I hope that's okay. I didn't really think about it. I just kind of figured since that's what we were kind of doing for the online mm -hmm. class and we we're combining them, that I would just combine them for the study guide as well. Um, even though we are having two separate exams, I guess I could combine it into one monster 200 point exam, but I didn't think you guys would be super down. No, uh -uh. We, we, we appreciate you. <laughs> so we'll, do, we'll still do a lecture and a lab exam. Uh, one, they'll be all multiple choice, select the answer kind of thing, and then the lab practical, which will be the pictures and what is this and all that fun okay. stuff. And today's lecture is the last part of the skeletal system. Um, we talk about joints. Um, shoot, I already started recording. I wanted to make a joke about choosing the week of 420 to study joints. Um, whatever. Uh, it still works. <laughs> it is the week of 420 and we're studying joints, but not the fun kind. Um, we're studying the kind in your body. And it is a lot. This one is a lot. Um, I just I only was just able to point the, post the PowerPoint because, not to make excuses, but I've been behind because um, I wanted to, do, wanted to do the study guide and the lecture, this PowerPoint, and like make sure that I'm not like putting anything on the study guide that isn't on the PowerPoint. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, what I ended up, I ended up just being like, there's so much information. The study guide is actually a really kind of shortened, summarized version of joints, which might seem crazy if you've looked at it, um, but as you'll see in this PowerPoint, um, there's gonna be a lot of peripheral information that I'm gonna talk about that isn't actually in the study guide. Um, I want you guys to hear it and see it, um, but you know, you may or may not be actually tested on some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so okay. the uh, uh, other announcements, I, excuse me, I updated the due date for labs 14 through 16, because I didn't, um, because I just added a page to lab 16, I figured it wasn't fair for to only give you guys a couple of days to work on that. So I'm sorry if you've been rushing on it, um, but I went ahead and extended that out to the 28th. So um, the, the appendicular skeleton stuff, um, that's not due until the 28th, because you guys are all pretty much done with the axial skeleton stuff. Um, most of you guys have turned in that, so I'm not worried about that, but I wanted to give you a little bit more time to do 16 in particular, but I extended 14 and 15 as well. Um, so you got a little bit more time um, on those. Uh, the study guide is up. I did amend it. I'm sorry. Um, you might want to double check and make sure that you got the latest copy. I amended it um, around 11 a.m. today, so if you downloaded it before this morning, um, you're gonna wanna um, take a look at it. I added a couple of things to the joints one um, because I was being really indecisive about what I wanted to include. Okay, let me start a screen share. I've got all kinds of fun stuff for us today, including possible me dancing around to do the um, muscle actions because we're gonna be talking about muscle actions today. Um, on top of like joint stuff um, because it kind of goes hand in hand even though we're not going to be actually talking that much about muscle actions um, until we get to until after the exam but I want to touch on it now so that by the time we start talking about muscles I can start using this language right off the bat you know like 
flex, extend, adduct, abduct, like I want to just be able to just use that language with you guys. So today's lecture is going to be um, a little bit long. And it's not going to cover, um, it's going to cover everything on the study guide, obviously, but it's going to cover a little bit more than that. So there'll be some extra stuff going on here. So let's get down to it. Oh, I also wanted to show you guys this. This is um, so cool. This is Essential Skeleton 4. This is an app that you can get on iPhone, iPad, Android, Mac, and PC. So obviously I'm on my Mac laptop. Um, well, not obviously I'm on my Mac laptop, but obviously I'm on a laptop or a computer. I'm on a Mac. I was able to download this for free. And all it is is a skeleton that you can click and move around and you can zoom in on it and see all the little bones um, and move them all, all around so you can see them at, from every angle. There's no like exploded skull, like you can't like, there's no like interior view of his skull, sadly, but the outer skull bones at least are cool. And you can um, click on the different bones and you can isolate them, which is, the coolest part of all, in my opinion. So being able to take them out of context and see what they look like by themselves, I think is a really, really, really valuable feature of this. So this is Essential Skeleton 4. It's free and it's available on every platform. Just search Essential Skeleton 4 on your phone, in your um, app store, or if you're on your computer, just say, just search Google um, Essential Skeleton 4 PC or Essential Skeleton for Mac. Essential Skeleton, the number four, Mac. Um, and you should be able to find it easily. There's also Essential Anatomy, which I know was brought up before. Um, it is a paid app. I might get it for like teaching purposes. It's a $20 app. Um, so I might invest in that so that we can use it for um, at least for next semester for sure, but also maybe for muscle muscular system. Am I freezing up? I'm so sorry, you guys. Um, go ahead and let me know if I uh, freeze up while I'm saying something that you want me to repeat. Um, and I'll repeat that. Um, and I've noticed, I don't know, I've, I've been like watching the YouTube videos and when they're uploaded, I've noticed that there are times when my video cuts out, but I've never noticed a time when my voice cuts out. So at least we know that you'll be able to hear me in the recorded video, you'll be able to hear everything. If you've noticed otherwise, um, let me know. But as far as I know, we may lose out on the video, um, but hopefully won't let me lose out on my audio um, when I'm when I'm as it in the recording. Okay. Okay. The extra credit for the joint thing. Okay. So since your lab manual doesn't have a section for joints specifically. I'm still going to assign a couple of pages out of the coloring book for today. Um, actually, maybe just one page. Probably just one page since there's not a whole lot else going on here. It would be page 48 of your coloring book and I'll send this to you, of course. This is a knee joint. Um, that would be the only thing and it would be for extra credit because there is not an actual lab for joints, therefore it was not incorporated into your points total for the course. So it would be an extra four points. Why did this just jump? Are we still recording? Oh, no, we're still recording. Woo, weird. My Zoom thing like moved and freaked me out. Okay, so without any further ado, I've introduced Essential Skeleton and I'll come back to that. But let's get going on this because it is long. So a joint, generally speaking, is also known as an articulation, okay? So it's a place where two or more bones meet uh, and interact with each other. Oh, so let me write this down for the extra credit. Um, there is no joints lab in your manual. So the page from the book that I'm assigning, which is page 48, will be above and 
beyond the um, uh, the points I have for lab for lab assignments. Um, I'll post the assignment with details later tonight. I promise. I promise I will do that. Okay. I don't have my notebook to write my notes in. This is going to be a problem. I'll use my lab manual. Okay. <clears throat> lab nine assignment and extra cred info. Okay. So more on that in a little bit. It'll be it'll be extra and it'll be like not due like tomorrow. I'll I'll make it. I'll give it. I'll give you guys plenty of time to do it to get your extra your extra four points on that guy. Oh, the exam is on the 30th. April 30th will be our lab and lecture exams according to our syllabus. Yes, so on that's a Thursday. That's next Thursday, a week from today. So next Tuesday, we'll have a review session since uh, today is the last lecture on skeletal system. We'll review on Tuesday and then we'll have our exams start on Thursday. And just like last time, they will be open through the weekend. So from Thursday to Sunday, that you'll still have a, um, a two hour time limit, but you'll have that window will be open from Thursday to Sunday for your exam. So same, time, same thing as last time, um, starting on the 30th this time. Okay. All right, you guys, I'm sorry we're having internet problems. Um, I'm wondering. Checking to see if I have anything open that I don't need. Um, I guess I don't need the app store, <laughs> but it's not really open. So this is what I got. The recording will be smoother. Let me try something then if we've got this problem. Hang on. If I move to my where my Wi-Fi is coming from, is it clearer now? Am I freezing as much now? Does it seem a little bit clearer? It seems clearer. I had to go to my Yeah. Is it still clear? Yeah, it's fine right now. Okay, right now? Okay, so I'm gonna, let me go grab my textbook and all my notes and stuff. Hang on. All right, question, Jessica. Como? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to find a joint. Uh, it's, I'm, uh... Okay, you guys, I can't guarantee that it won't be noisy since this is like kind of our entryway to our backyard so that we might if i blow the dogs out and stuff it's gonna get noisy but if it's clearer then it's worth it right so let's get going all right all right so we've got <laughs> joints as articulations where two or more bones meet right and they interact with each other they obviously give your skeleton mobility, right? Because if the bones are able to move around each other, then you're able to move. Um, but also they are important in holding the skeleton together, not just in terms of the ones that are movable. You have joints in between every separate bone in your body. So even like the bones of your skull, which seem like they're all solid and together, where those separate bones meet is still considered an articulation. It's still considered a joint. Um, it is considered a certain type of joint. So you have three different types of joints based on their structure. So there is a structural classification of joints. We had to move in here because the Wi-Fi is whack. Don't mind us. You hear my dogs tip tapping around. I'm sorry. So you have three types of joints, structurally speaking. Okay, so this is the structural classification of joints. They are fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, 
or synovial joints. Okay, so those three are considered structural classifications of joints. So all the joints in your body fall into one of these three categories. And there are other categories too that we're gonna talk about. So don't get too excited, it's not that simple. The uh, other classification of joints is the functional classification of joints. So their structure is based on um, um, whether they, um, Hmm. Fibrous versus cartilaginous versus synovial. Um, it's, a, it's about what they're made of, like how they're put together. So like fibrous joints are, have a certain type of connective tissue. They're very dense. Um, cartilaginous joints are made of cartilaginous tissue um, only. And then they have a very certain um, way that they're made, which we'll talk about. And then synovial joints, which are the, the highly movable joints, um, in all of the parts of your body that move freely are all, um, they're structured in a very specific way and we're gonna talk about their structure. But their function, as in how they work, not what they're made of, but how they work is another set of classifications. And those include synarthroses, so those are joints that are immovable, okay? So synarthrotic joints, are considered synarthroses and they are immovable. Okay, so they're like solid. So an example of a synarthrotic joint would be like the suture that's um, between like the parietal bones of your skull, right? That's immovable, ideally, right? We don't want those moving around. Amphiarthroses are joints that are slightly movable, okay? And diarthroses are joints that are freely movable, okay? They move freely. So you might think, okay, well, synarthroses must be fibrous, amphiarthroses must be cartilaginous, and diarthroses must be synovial, but not so fast. It's not so simple. There are, in fact, cartilaginous joints that are synarthrotic, and there are cartilaginous joints that are amphiarthrotic. Um, all synovial joints are, oops, all synovial joints are diarth diarthrotic because of the, um, the way that they are structured, um, but they don't just fall easily into the structural categories the way that they do into the functional categories. So let's get into that a little bit more by talking about the different functional, sorry, the different structural types of joints. So let's go through the different structural types. That's fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial, okay? starting with fibrous. So these are joints, structurally speaking, are joined by dense fibrous connective tissue, okay? There is no joint cavity, so other joint types will actually have a space in between the bones, right, that is filled with fluid, which is called a joint cavity. Um, fibrous joints do not have that, it's just dense fibrous connective tissue, and most of them are, of course, synarthrotic. They are immovable. Okay, so they fall into this functional category of synarthroses. They are synarthrotic. And of course, there are three different types of fibrous joints. Okay, so all of these are, um, actually, I can't say that for sure. Let's see. These three are all fibrous joints. Let's see if they are all synarthrotic. Okay, um, since most are synarthrotic, we may be, we may be um, facing an exception here. So let's find out. Sutures, the first type of fibrous joint, are rigid interlocking joints containing short connective tissue fibers, okay? They are only found in the skull. So the joints between your skull bones, your skull bones and your facial bones mostly, um, not including like your jaw, right? All of the bones of your cranium that are um, immovable, right? Those are going to be fibrous, joints, specifically sutures, okay? They're specifically sutures. That they are the type of fibrous joint that we call sutures. They allow for growth during youth, right? So the reason that we have these joints is so that you have a little bit of mobility um, to grow, obviously, um, and also to be born, right? So those, these sutures before you're born, um, they're obviously, they're not like as fused as they are in the adult form. Um, so there's a lot of movement that happens there so that the skull can kind of like 
be squished out of form during birth. Um, and then during, I thought that was like the Middle Ages. I was like, that's weird. In Middle Age, when you become Middle Aged, the sutures ossify and are called synostases. Okay, so don't fret about that so much. Just know that as you get older and you become a, a technical a biological adult, the sutures ossify completely. Okay, so um, they are short connective tissue fibers for a lot of your life and then eventually they will ossify. And then it's just interlocking bone, right? But it's still a suture, it's still a fibrous joint. Okay, so here's a picture of a suture in the skull. So this is the suture in between the frontal, the parietal, and the temporal bones right here. Um, this is supposed to be the dense fibrous connective tissue, okay. Syndesmosis, so this is the second type of fibrous joint that we're gonna talk about. Syndesmoses are when bones are connected by ligaments, uh, which are made of fibrous connective tissue, right? Um, that are, that can be uh, immovable to slightly movable. So here's that exception, right? So the syndesmoses um, are not simply synarthrotic. They may also be diarthrotic, right? So um, the tibio tibiofibular joint, which I'll show you a picture of in a second, is considered synarthrotic. It does not move at all. It is immovable, right? So the functional classification of this particular type of fibrous joint is synarthrotic. But there are syndesmoses, fibrous joints, that are diarthrotic, including the um, interosseous membrane between the radius and the ulna, okay? So remember, your radius and your ulna um, are not fused. There's a space in between them and there's actually a connective tissue, um, a membrane of connective tissue in between the two bones. And that is also considered to be a joint. It's considered to be a fibrous joint since that connective tissue is fibrous, um, but it is slightly movable. So it's considered a diarthrotic joint, okay? In terms of function, right? Structurally, it's a fibrous joint. Functionally, it is diarthrotic. Um, Remember, sutures are a, a synarthrotic fibrous joint, and the distal tibiofibular joint is a synarthrotic fibrous joint as well. So here is that distal tibiofibular joint, okay? These um, ligaments here that are connecting the tibia to the fibula um, don't give at all, okay? So this is a synarthrotic joint. It is a fibrous joint and it uh, is in between, it holds the tibia and the fibula together down at your ankle, okay? So that is the example of a syndesmosis, uh, uh, singular, and the two types of syndesmoses that we're talking about are the distal tibial fibula joint and that membrane in between the radius and the ulna. This one is synarthrotic. This one is diarthrotic, slightly movable. All right, if you're still with me, <laughs> the last type of fibrous joint is a gomphoses, or are the gomphoses, plural. These are pagan socket joints of the teeth, okay? Your teeth are not considered to be bones, they're a separate thing. Um, but where your tooth goes into your mandible or your maxilla uh, is considered a joint, and it's considered a fibrous joint, okay? Um, you don't have to worry about any details beyond that. The gomphoses um, are basically your tooth sockets, okay? So here's a gomphosis, right? It is a pig in socket, fibrous joint, and it is uh, ideally synarthrotic, right? This is going to be immovable. This is an immovable joint. We've got our um, uh, fibrous connective tissue, uh, in the form of a periodontal ligament holding the tooth in. I don't know if anybody is going to into dentistry, but this is probably the only time in the class where you might be interested. <laughs> but uh, this is like the only time that we're gonna like touch on teeth really, except for when we get to the digestive system in the fall. But um, this um, gomphosis is uh, um, an example of a fibrous joint, a synarthrotic fibrous joint, okay? 
All right, so quick recap. You've got your three structural classifications of joints, fibrous, cartilaginous, and uh, uh, synovial, right? We just talked about the three different types of uh, fibrous joint and what functional category they fall into, right? As in, are they synarthrotic, are they um, diarthrotic, or are they amphiarthrotic, slightly movable in between, okay? Okay, ask yeah. a question, Ashley. Yep. Go for it, go for it. Just to recap before we even move on, because uh -huh. is... okay. I know, it's a lot, I know. Okay, so there's the three types of joints, right? Yep. The fibrous, and then, um, I can't say Cartilaginous. Cartilaginous. Mm -hmm. and As in cartilage. Okay, right. so those are three different ones. And then, no, no. those are like the general classifications that all of your joints fall into. They're going to okay. be one of the three. Sorry, okay. one of the three. <laughs> so one so, of the three. Hmm. And then um, they're either are, um, and then they may, they may fall into whatever uh, functional category, right? So those three structural categories, fibrous, cartilaginous, and um, synovial, uh, any joint within those categories, which is all the joints in your body, they may be functionally speaking, uh, synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, or diarthrotic. So the di uh, the diarthrotic. Mm -hmm. Okay, you said that's the one usually between the um, the ulna and the radius, right? Because it's slightly movable. The it's amphiarthrotic. Okay, amphiarthrotic. Does that is it not? Does it, is that not what it said? I can't go back until like oh, we're. Oh, it does say that. Shoot, okay. you're right. Oh. Synarthrotic, diarthrotic, freely movable. Well, now I have to double check that. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> saying that like, damn you, DJ. Now I have to double check that. But I need to. I now I need to double check that because I was going by what the PowerPoint already said, and I'm assuming that that's correct, but I said something else. So, um, all right, instead of trying to do that right now. We could do that later. Just as yeah, well. I'm gonna, but I wanna emphasize to you guys that um, if you've looked at the study guide yet, if you have, yes. if you have or have not looked at the study guide yet, um, I did ask for you to know an example. Wow, it doesn't even say in the textbook that I can find. Your, your thing says be able to identify them by sight and be able to name examples. Okay, so if that were the case, um, or if, you, if, if it were the case on an exam when you would have to name an example of a um, amphiarthrotic or a diarthrotic joint, mm -hmm. um, I would say, or, a, or a, if I were to ask you for an example of a diarthrotic or an amphiarthrotic um, fibrous joint, one, I'm not going to ask you a question like that. That's crazy. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's not, if I did that, then there would be, it would be a multiple choice question or something like that. Okay. But um, I'm just surprised that I'm not able to find it in the textbook right off the bat. Entry to the connective tibia, just blah, 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 blah. Interosseous membrane, substantial sheet. Okay, I'm going to radius and they form the other increase between the tibia and the fibula of the leg. It's fibrous joint and permits slight movement. So this is actually a typo. This is incorrect. I was right. I just want to make that absolutely clear. I was right. That's on page 291, if you want to check me. <laughs> <laughs> That's on page 291. It says that these interosseous membranes of which, uh, which exist in between the radius and ulna and the tibia and fibula, which are just like, uh, almost looks like spider webs of mm -hmm. tissue in between the two bones. Um, it's slightly, it's considered slightly movable. So it's amphiarthrotic. It's not diarthrotic. Got it. Great question. And I'm glad that we figured that out because that's annoying. <laughs> okay. Nope, that's correct. Okay. So uh, again, we've got for your fibrous joints, sutures, syndesmoses, and gomphoses. 
the sutures are um, synarthrotic, so they do not move at all. The syndesmoses include both the things like the distal tibiofibular joint, which is where the, um, the two bones, the tibia and fibula, are, I've got it right here, oops, are bound together by a ligament and this does not move. So this is also synarthrotic. And then syndesmosis also includes those interosseous membranes in between the paired bones of your radius and ulna and your tibia and fibula. So there's like a spider web in between here. And those are considered slightly movable amphiarthrotic. So your, um, as far as your fibrous um, joints go, they're not all synarthrotic, right? They, uh, the only amphiarthrotic example would be those interosseous membranes in between the bones. So it'd be the one that's like a spider web in between the length of the bone, right? This uh, syndesmosis, which is the distal tibiofibula joint with this ligament right here is synarthrotic. This is considered immovable, this one right here, okay? Sort of, meh. Um, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, um, I need to like make like a chart that like, or actually that would be a really good exercise would be to make a chart of all this. What you're gonna wanna do is like write it all, write it all out. So write out the structural joint classifications and the functional joint classifications, and then just start like drawing connections to certain um, joint examples, certain ex examples of joints. So of the fibrous joints, put down your, type, your three types of fibrous joints, and then whether or not they're uh, synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, diarthrotic, maybe color code it, actually. Make the ones that are red, the ones that are synarthrotic, the ones that are green or amphiarthrotic, and the ones that are blue or diarthrotic. You know, I think there's, there's different, there's ways that we can do this, that we can make this like color coded and easier to study because um, it is, it is a lot of information as per usual. Welcome to anatomy class. It's um, a lot. It's a lot. Um, are we ready to go on to cartilaginous for now? Yeah. Okay. The last fibrous joint, the gomphoses are um, synarthrotic, synarth um, right? So those ones are immovable. Last example. So the only example of any fibrous joint is those interosseous membranes that are amphiarthrotic, slightly movable. Everything else is not movable, synarthrotic. Okay. Cartilaginous joints, of which there are two types, um, are made are un, are united by cartilage, as per the name, right? So they are cartilaginous by nature, um, by uh, structure right? There is, again, no joint cavity. So a joint cavity is, is pretty much a synovial joint thing. Um, fibrous joints and cartilaginous joints don't have joint cavities. Let's talk about the two different types of cartilaginous joints and which um, functional classifications they fall under. Synchondroses. These guys are when a plate of hyaline cartilage unites the bones. And these are all synarthrotic. So these are all immobile, immovable, right? No movement in synchondroses. So this includes your epiphyseal plate at the ends of your long bones, right? Which isn't even a thing when you get older, when you reach like middle age or your mid, even just your mid 20s. This turns into the uh, epiphyseal line, remember? Um, so that ossifies. Uh, much like the sutures of, of your skull, but this is a cartilaginous joint because the sutures of your skull are joined by dense fibrous connective tissue. And these joints, these synchondroses, are joined by hyaline cartilage. That's what makes it a cartilaginous joint, is what's in between these parts of bone, okay? The other places where you're gonna find hyaline cartilage uh, joining bones together is, of course, the costal cartilage of your ribs, right? So remember when we talked about um, true ribs versus false ribs? Actually, this is like the one time when this is not quite as useful because this doesn't show any cartilage. This is just straight bone. But we talked about the true ribs being the ones that are uh, directly connected to the sternum via cartilage. 
where's my where's my skeleton where's my friend here's my buddy okay so uh, this guy we can still see the cartilage and you can see that the first seven ribs remember one two three four five Oh no, he's up there. There's one up there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven ribs are joined to the sternum via cartilage. And that cartilage is hyaline cartilage. And these uh, joints, this joint, which is technically the joint between the rib and the sternum, is a synchondrosis. A synchondrosis okay, so that's a synchondrosis. Oops. Synchondrosis, 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 and these are all synarthrotic. There's no movement that happens in between uh, these, in these joints, within these joints, okay? So that's one type of cartilaginous joint. The other type are symphyses, and um, there's a couple of examples that we've actually already mentioned uh, in this class. So again, um, we do have hyaline cartilage, hence cartilaginous joint but we also have fibrocartilage in there as well. And recall that fibrocartilage is really good for absorbing shock, right? So we have fibrocartilage, fibrocartilage in places um, that are prone to um, being compressed uh, with a high weight in terms of like jumping up and down, that type of thing, right? Um, these are slightly movable, you know, which is important, it's very important. We see symphyses in a couple of different places. We've already talked about them. One is the intervertebral discs, okay? So those discs, those little chunks of cartilage that fit in between the vertebrae of your uh, spinal column um, are considered symphyses. They are a specific type of cartilaginous joint called a symphysis, and they are uh, amphiarthrotic, so they are slightly movable, okay? Um, which is pretty important, seeing as like you move your spine around a lot. You really would like to be able to continue to do that. And that is thanks to the fact that they are amphi, this is an amphiarthrotic joint, functionally speaking, right? The structural classification is a cartilaginous joint. The functional classification is an amph amphiarthrosis, right? Amphiarthrosis. The other example is the pubic symphysis, right? So we've kind of touched on that when we talked about the appendicular skeleton. We talked about the coxal bones um, being the pelvic girdle, how they um, combine to the axial skeleton here at the sacrum at the back, um, and then they join each other at the front at the pubic symphysis. So again, this is, a, this is a little pad of hyaline cartilage. It's actually a little pad of fibrocartilage wrapped in hyaline cartilage that allows for um, shock absorption and slight movement and that slight movement is, again, important in childbirth, right? We want to be able to um, move this around, if not actually dissociate it slightly um, to make this true pelvis, the uh, birth canal, uh, as wide as possible during childbirth. Okay, so that's the two types of cartilaginous joints, which specifically, structurally speaking, are joints that have cartilage in between the bones at that articulation, okay? So they include our synchondrosis, which is hyaline cartilage alone, binding two bones together, includes our little um, coastal cartilage of, of joining the ribs to the sternum, and the epiphyseal plate at the ends of your long bones. I don't know if your book gives another example. Nope, those are the examples. Cool. And then you've got symphyses, which are fibrocartilage wrapped in hyaline cartilage. Uh, and examples are the intervertebral discs and the pubic symphysis. Okay, so we've talked about fibrous joints, structurally speaking, fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, structurally speaking. Of the three examples of fibrous joints, there's only one example that is not synarthrotic, right? The only amphiarthrotic example of a fibrous joint is that interosseous membrane in between the paired bones of your, low, of your lower arms and your lower legs. Of the cartilaginous joints, the um, synch synchondrosis are synarthrotic and the symphyses are amphiarthrotic. 
okay? Again, I think writing these out in terms of the structural uh, classification and then examples under that, and then color code them according to their functional classification, okay? So make a, choose a color for synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, and diarthrotic, and um, then color code the different examples under the structural classification. So fibrous joints, examples, cartilaginous joints, examples, synovial joints, examples, and then color code them according to their functional classification. Are they synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, or diarthrotic, okay? So I would sort it out that way. Um, maybe I'll get to work on that and share what I've got when I finish such a fun little project. Just talking about it makes me just so stoked to do that. <laughs> I'm only being a little bit sarcastic. I actually had a lot of fun doing that when I had to learn this. Um, so let's see. So joint classification um, chart. Let's see what we can come up with for that. That will be very helpful for all of this. Okay, so fibrous joints and cartilaginous joints um, and their examples, they're named really, really weird, but there's only a few of them, okay? Synovial joints are named much more intuitively, um, but of course there are a buttload of them, unfortunately. So uh, luckily they all have the exact same functional classification. They are all diarthrotic. They are all fully movable, okay? So synovial joints are all highly movable. They are the, all of the rest of the joints of your body that you think of. They include most of the joints of your body, okay? So fibrous joints and cartilaginous joints constitute a minority of the joints in your body. The rest are all synovial joints and um, fully movable, okay? So all of, the, all of your limb joints um, are, are synovial joints. There are certain things that all synovial joints have in common. So even though we're gonna talk about a lot of different types and they're all gonna seem like, like pretty different, they actually all have the same basic structure with some of the same basic um, um, things involved in them, okay? So they all have articular cartilage. So the two bones that are, being, that are interacting are going, to are going to be capped in cartilage, not the same as a cartilaginous joint, where that's the only thing in between the two bones. In synovial joints, the two bones are capped in articular cartilage, but there's more going on in between. Namely, you have a joint cavity, also sometimes known as a synovial cavity, since it's a synovial joint, okay? Synovial joints have synovial cavities, also known as joint cavities, this is a small space, it's a gap, okay, in between the two articulating bones, which are capped in hyaline cartilage. The joint capsule is made of dense irregular connective tissue, okay, but again, it's not a fibrous joint because that's not the only thing in between the two bones. And the Articular capsule, which is different than the cavity, okay? The cavity is the actual space. It's that actual hollow space. The capsule is what's holding that space in, okay? So the articular or joint capsule, so you could say that you have a joint capsule encapsulating a joint cavity, okay? The joint capsule is hollow and that space inside is the joint cavity. And it's made of, the capsule is made of dense irregular connective tissue, okay? Let's, okay, so that's three distinguishing features. There are more, so let's carry on. They also all have synovial fluid, which fills that joint cavity, okay? So that hollow space in between the two bones is full of fluid. It's full of synovial fluid because it's a synovial joint, okay? Um, it's basically a lubricant um, for the bones to move freely around each other, okay, and not be rubbing against each other. It's, a, it's an addition to that hyaline cartilage that caps the ends of the bones, which also helps um, to prevent rubbing, right? So the synovial fluid, it's viscous, it's slippery, uh, it comes, it's derived from the plasma of the blood, uh, and then also hyaluronic acid. So you might see hyaluronic acid uh, prescribed um, for joint problems, right, to improve the, um, the lubrication of the joints. Uh, I'm not sure if it actually works if you take it, like, on a diet level, um, but I guess it's worth a try. 
Okay, so the synovial fluid, viscous, slippery, um, which lubricates and nourishes the articular cartilage, which caps the ends of the two bones that are involved in the uh, synovial joint in that articulation, okay? Okay, so here's a picture. So this doesn't actually look like any synovial joint in real life, okay? This is a cartoon a uh, representation, highly generalized, oversimplified representation of all synovial joints, okay? So this is basically a picture that shows you a synovial joint with all of the different parts that I'm talking about now, okay? So here's the ends of the two bones that are involved. You have the distal end of the proximal bone. You with me? the proximal end of the distal bone, am I right? And then in between, capping those, you have your articular cartilage in blue here, right? Which is actually technically hyaline cartilage, but it's the articular cartilage of the synovial joint. And here on the other bone. And in between those, you have the joint cavity, joint or synovial cavity, and that is full of synovial fluid, okay? So this has got all that nice lubricating synovial fluid inside of this cavity. And then in green, we've got actually the, um, the joint capsule has several different parts, but you don't need to know the different parts of it, okay? We will include both this, uh, this fibrous capsule and the inner membrane. Uh, will be considered all part of the joint capsule, okay? So those three parts, the articular cartilage, the um, joint cavity full of synovial fluid, and the um, joint capsule, which is basically holding everything in, okay? So joint capsule, the green part is the interior membrane of that joint capsule, uh, but you don't have to remember specifically what it's called. It is the synovial membrane, but don't worry about it. It's part of the joint capsule. And then the last part of all synovial joints is that because those bones are not actually like interlocking and they're not actually like touching at all, um, that joint capsule um, is, it's made of fibrous connective tissue, which is strong, but it's not strong enough to like keep your like parts of your limbs from like dislocating all the time, right? Um, so in order to hold those bones together and to keep your joints together, you also are going to have um, reinforcing ligaments, okay? So again, ligaments, or maybe not again, we haven't actually talked about this very much yet. So ligaments connect bone to bone, uh, while tendons connect bone to muscle. So we're gonna see a lot of tendons when we talk about the muscular system. Today, since we're talking about joints and the skeletal system, we're talking about ligaments, which connect bone to bone, okay? So you've got, uh, various types of reinforcing ligaments, um, and they all vary according to what joint we're actually talking about. Um, but you have some that are part of the, um, the capsule, um, the joint capsule. Um, you have an extra capsular, which are outside of the capsule, and intracapsular, which are inside or deep to the capsule. Okay, so that synovial membrane is act would actually be covering those intracapsular reinforcing ligaments in certain synovial joints, okay? But just know that there are reinforcing ligaments like this one, which are holding these joints together. It's very important. They're actually holding the bones together, okay? We'll talk about specific examples for a couple of joints, specific joints. Other than that, um, that general um, accounting of everything that every synovial joint has uh, will suffice, okay? So that's, that's good. We're gonna talk about some specific synovial joints, but only a couple of them. So all synovial joints have those five factors, okay? They have, a, they have articular cartilage, they have a synovial or joint cavity, which is full of synovial fluid and is surrounded by a joint capsule, and then outside or inside of the joint capsule, around it, you're going to have um, uh, reinforcing ligaments, okay? So those may be capsular, extracapsular, or intracapsular, whether they're outside or inside of the actual um, 
joint capsule. Okay. All right. Oh, mm, eh, don't worry about this so much, but they do, they are obviously rich in nerve and blood supply. Um, if they weren't rich in a nerve supply, then you wouldn't have joint pain, right? It's important to have a nerve supply to your joints so that you know when you have messed them up, right? Um, my nerves going to my uh, right knee right now are telling me that I uh, did something bad to that. So my movement, my dancing around today might be a little bit um, not up to snuff because of that, but we'll see. Um, also, the capillary beds, the blood supply, that's, what, that's where you get that synovial fluid from, right? So it's a filtrate of the blood, of the blood plasma. Um, and so therefore you need a blood supply in order to get that from. So that's where that comes from. Okay. All right. Extra stuff that happen uh, in synovial joints, okay? You do have these weird things called bursae, okay? A bursa, singular, is like a little pillow. It's a little pillow of connective tissue that's full of fluid on the inside, okay? So it's like a little, it's a fibrous sac. It's a little pillow filled with fluid, um, synovial fluid, and it acts like ball bearings. Um, where your where the ligaments and the muscles and uh, your skin and tendons and bones where everything rubs together, you might have a little bursa in between, like say the bone and the ligament, so that when the ligament moves over the bone, the little your little bursa is going to sort of like squish back and forth and create a little bit of extra movement and padding, so that those things aren't rubbing directly on each other. So here's a picture of a bursa in green. So here's your little bursa, your little um, fibrous sac or pillow. Here's the synovial fluid on the inside. And when this ligament um, pulls onto, pulls on the muscle, or sorry, pulls on the bone on the other side over here, um, the little bursa is going to like um, squish back and forth. Okay, so it's like if you have like a little, um, I don't know, those weird things that you had as kids that were like full of goo, little, little, um, those weird little things that are full of goo and you would like sort of like squish it back and forth. That's kind of like what a bursa is. And so it helps to create um, more smoothness in between this ligament and the bones so that they're not just rubbing directly on each other. Okay, um, so generally speaking, a bursa is a, um, a fibrous sac full of synovial fluid um, that can be found in between um, different structures of the joint. So between a ligament and the bone, the bone and the bone, um, tendon and the bone, skin and the bone, um, wherever these things rub, you may find bursae. Similar to a bursa is a tendon sheath. It's literally just a long skinny bursa um, that wraps completely around a tendon um, instead of just sitting in between the tendon and the bone or whatever, this guy is going to wrap completely around a tendon. So uh, this is a bursa and this is a tendon sheath. Okay, so it's a long skinny bursa that wraps around a tendon um, and it does the exact same thing as any other bursa. Okay, so it basically just like shifts back and forth as the tendon moves and um, keeps the, um, the tendon from... Um, rubbing side to side against the bone. And sometimes if you like are feeling um, certain like your certain joints and you feel sort of like fibrous, sort of like clicking almost as you're rubbing across, um, that may be some of those um, tendon sheaths, right? Um, around the ligaments that are kind of giving them that sort of like slippery, sort of like moving over the bone. Or if you like, move weird and you can kind of feel them clicking. You can kind of feel the tendons clicking over the bone. Um, that's where your tendon sheets come into play. To keep the tendon from actually physically like skipping over the bone, the, the tendon sheath is allowing it to sort of like move smoothly over the bone surface. Pretty neat. Um, so you can get inflamed uh, bursae, right? And so if you've ever heard of bursitis, that's what that is, okay? So if you get these, if you get inflammation in these bursae, um, including tendon sheaths, then you end up having, and we call that bursitis, right? Because itis is just inflammation of whatever, right? Bursitis is inflammation of the bursae. All right. 
Okay, so when we talked about these reinforcing ligaments, that's one factor that keeps uh, your joints together, right? Keeps them strong, um, but they can't be the only thing, at least not in all of your synovial joints, because um, that would make it still pretty easy to totally dislocate your joints or overextend and like mess up your joints, right? So there are other factors that go into stabilizing uh, your synovial joints, right? Your diarthrotic, fully movable synovial joints that come in many different shapes and sizes, but all have those five, six factors involved, okay? First thing that helps to stabilize your joints, the shapes of the articular surfaces, okay? So the shape of, the, of whatever bones are articulating at the synovial joint, whatever shape they are is going to play a minor role in how stable that joint is, okay? So for example, consider like a joint of your finger, right? So you've got a little short joint of your um, middle phalanx and the end of your uh, proximal phalanx, right? And they're kind of just sitting next to each other, but they're sort of like, each end of them is just sort of flat, right? So they're, all, they're next to each other and they're being held together by, by ligaments, really, okay? So this is where those guys come together. But then you think about like your hip joint, the ball and socket of your hip. Think about the shapes of those two articular surfaces, right? The shape of the head of the femur is so round and the shape of the acetabulum, right? Which is the socket in the coxal bone of your pelvis is so deep, that's such a deep um, like groove in the coxal bone for the head of the femur to go into, that those two shapes and the way that they work together, uh, those actually, it plays a, a major role in um, how stable that joint is. It's really important, right? So that is a strong joint um, based just on that, the shapes are the articular surfaces. But since most joints do not have that kind of strength just in terms of their shape like that, like even your shoulder joint, you know, the glenoid cavity doesn't seem that deep as compared to the acetabulum, right? When you go back and look at the scapula, check out that glenoid cavity, it's shallow. It's very shallow. Um, and so for a joint like that, for your shoulder joint, you're gonna want to have lots and lots of ligaments so you'll have more ligaments at this joint in order to keep these bones together and not dislocate them. Um, but then also muscle tone. So the tendons that go across the joint need to stay strong, okay? And the only reason for them to be pulling strongly is if they're being pulled by strong muscles, okay? So you wanna definitely, you have to maintain a certain amount of muscle tone in order to avoid um, um, messing up your joints, right? Just probably part of my problem when I messed up my knee um, was that I didn't have, I don't, I don't have the muscle, the leg strength, the, the strength of certain muscles in my legs to uh, stabilize that joint, or I didn't when I went hiking last Saturday. That was my, that was my fault. Um, should keep in better shape. I've been sitting around too much. Okay, so your shoulder and your knee joints and the arches of your foot um, those joints um, are more um, prone to injury or dislocation, worst case, um, if you don't have um, enough muscle tone uh, to keep them, to keep those bones pulled together by the tendons that are attaching those muscles to the bone, right? Okay, so those are some stabilizing factors um, for synovial joints, right? So remember, fibrous joints and cartilaginous joints they don't really care so much about this since they're pretty much, they're pretty much immovable, right? Immovable or slightly movable, right? They're synarthrotic or amphiarthrotic. So they don't have to worry so much about other things trying to keep them together. There's not much that's trying to pull them apart. Okay. So again, synovial joints are um, for movement. They're to keep you, to get your skeleton up and moving around, right? You've got... Um, the origin and insertion of the muscles that um, basically pull across joints in order for you to, in order to create all the types of movements that your skeleton can have, um, 
where it attaches to the bone that doesn't move. So say we're talking about your deltoid, which is ab uh, abducting your arm. So if you're moving your arm up like this, you have one end of the muscle, the deltoid muscle, right? Your shoulder muscle that's attached to an immovable bone. Okay, so it's attached up here um, to, um, I, think, I think the top of the scapula, but I'm not sure. Either way, this is the point that does not move and it's considered the origin of that muscle. We're talking about the deltoid muscle. The origin of the muscle does not move. The insertion is at the deltoid tuberosity of your humerus, right? So that deltoid tuberosity, that, bo that like bony projection on your humerus is where the deltoid inserts, and this is the bone that moves. So the humerus is the bone that is moving when your deltoid muscle contracts, okay? So that's what's meant by the origin and insertion. The origin is the point that doesn't move, the insertion is the point that does move, okay? Muscle contraction causes the insertion to move towards the origin, of course, right? And movements can occur along the transverse, frontal, or sagittal planes, right? So any types of these movements that your joints are causing can happen in three dimensions, obviously, since we are three-dimensional creatures, right? So the three dimensions are exemplified by the three anatomical planes, right? The transverse plane, the frontal plane, and the sagittal plane, right? Okay, so your joints can make movements in any of those directions, and they do that with the help of muscles that pull the bones either closer or farther away from each other, right, in any whatever direction, and they do this by uh, having a point of origin on an immovable spot and a point of insertion where it moves, okay? So muscles only contract, they only pull, and they pull from a point of insertion or sorry, a point of origin to a point of insertion. And that's how they move your bones around across joints, right? So all of these synovial joints, okay? All right, this is really kind of background stuff for when we talk about um, muscle actions, okay? So if we do talk about origins and, 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 origins and insertions, it'll just be um, in order for me to help you um, to like basically join together the muscular and the skeletal system. Um, but I'm not gonna have you memorize the origins and insertions of every muscle. Um, I'll just mention them here and there, um, hopefully hoping to kind of like draw connections between things that we've already looked at in terms of bone markings um, to stuff that we're learning, new stuff that we're learning in terms of muscles, okay? So anyway, okay, so. Still talking about synovial joints, diarthrotic, fully movable. There are um, planes of motion, right? So in three dimensions, your joints are able to move your body in all three dimensions, transverse, frontal, sagittal. The types of movements um, between those dimensions uh, come in four different flavors, if you will, okay? So non-axial movements are movements that don't exactly happen like in a plane. Um, they're um, almost more like they're at a point, well, happening at a point. Um, that'll make more sense when we get to an example. A uniaxial range of motion, a uniaxial motion of a synovial joint will be a motion that occurs only in one plane, okay? So there are certain movements of joints where you're moving only in one plane, where bones are moving across each other like this. In other types of joints, you have biaxial motion, which is movement in two planes, okay? So basically something like a hinge joint might be moving in two planes, okay? Because you're only working with um, this plane, right? Um, but, or this plane, but you're, but you're only working one at a time. So multi-axial joints are going to be movement around all three planes. So like ball and socket joints are gonna be joints that can move in all three planes. 
let's look at some examples to clarify that. Okay, before we talk about examples of this, these types of movements, we have to put them in the context of the joint types that they um, fall into. I'm sorry, you guys, I know. This is, seems like a, it's like a Russian nesting doll of um, nightmare. <laughs> so bear with me. So you've got several different types of synovial joints and based on whatever, whatever type they are, they're going to have one of these four types of movement, okay? So um, let's talk about these examples and then we will discuss the types of movement that each of them have. So this is not unlike the, um, it's kind of like the functional um, classification of fibrous and cartilaginous joints here a little bit, it feels like, but um, I hope it's a little bit more intuitive because we're talking about synovial joints. So a lot of these things will be a little bit more easy to visualize, I think. So let's just uh, push on forward into plane joints, okay? So the first type of a, a synovial joint specifically, okay, is a plane joint. So these are one of those non-axial joints, okay? So this is just sort of like slipping movement that's not really happening um, across a plane per se. Um, these are flat articular surfaces and only do short gliding movements, okay? And these uh, plane joints include the joints in between the carpal bones of your wrist, okay? And also the tarsal bones of your ankle. So like this kind of like wrist movement, um, those movements are really kind of just like one uh, chunky short bone sort of like um, moving very, very slightly over its neighbors, okay? So that's considered a plane joint. The intercarpal joints are considered to be plane joints and they are non-axial, okay? Hinge joints are uniaxial, okay? So these guys are moving along a single plane. They um, are for flexion and extension only. So like I was talking about um, the elbow joint, I think I might've said this was a, bi a bilateral. Um, or biaxial, that, that's not correct, it's uniaxial, sorry. So this one plane, that's it. So basically all that a hinge joint does is it flexes and it extends, and that all occurs in one plane, okay? Flexion, extension, that's all in one plane. I hope you can see that. All in one plane, flexion, extension, okay? So that's considered to be uniaxial, okay? that type of movement, as opposed to the non-axial movement of your wrist bones where you just have a little bit of slipping across the bones. Okay, pivot joints are when one rounded end of a bone uh, goes into the sleeve or ring of another bone and you have uniaxial movement only. This is the uniaxial example of uh, spinning. Okay, so the joint in between the ulna and the radius, so here's, this is the horse hoof of that uh, proximal uh, end of the radius and the bottle opener of the um, proximal end of the ulna. These guys interact with each other and they are the reason why you're able to um, pronate and supinate your hand, why you're able to do this kind of action is because of this joint right here which is where the head of the radius fits into the sleeve. Well, first it fits into this, the notch, right? The radial notch of the ulna, but it also goes through this sleeve, which is this ligament right here. And then it actually spins inside of that. So it's able to, to rotate back and forth. Um, so that is considered a, a, a uniaxial joint in addition to the, um, Hinge joint, right? Hinge joint, one plane. Um, a pivot joint is basically, it's one plane like this. So it's basically like this plane, that movement is happening. Okay, condyloid or ellipsoidal joints. Condyloid is fine. These guys are the biaxial joints. Both of the articular surfaces are oval. So you're able to basically move in, um, like all in four directions, so in two planes. 
So an example would be your finger bones, which are condyloid joints, okay? So you're basically able to, um, at the, actually just between the, uh, the metatarsal and the uh, proximal uh, phalanx, you can, um, you can move your finger forward and backward, but you can also move it side to side, right? So you can do this and you can do this, and therefore it is biaxial, okay? So this plane moving like this and this frontal plane moving like this. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so biaxial is being able to move along two different planes. So the joint between your metacarpals and the proximal phalanx. The metacarpophalangeal joint, <laughs> if you want to get technical about it, but you don't have to know that, is a, um, just know the joint between the metacarpal and the proximal phalanx is fine. Um, is a bi uh, biaxial, um, it's a condyloid joint that exhibits biaxial movement. Okay. Saddle joints are where one bone sort of fits like a saddle over the other bone. So you've got a little bit more freedom of movement than um, condyloid joints, although they are similar. So condyloid joints is basically like a little cup and the other bone um, sort of fits into that cup. And a saddle joint is more like a, it looks like a bean. It's like a bean fitting over another bean, okay? So these guys are also um, biaxial. So you also get this kind of movement and this kind of movement, but you get more of it. Um, so your thumb is the example of that. So you get a lot more of this side-to-side -side movement um, than your fingers are really capable of, and more of the um, front and back movement um, than your fingers are really capable of. So you get like a much greater range of motion, um, maybe not that much greater, but it is greater than what you have in that um, intercarpal phalangeal joint over here, okay? So this is a um, condyloid joint, and this is a saddle joint. Jason's laughing at me. Okay, lastly is the ball and socket joint, okay? These are our multi-axial joints. They have the most freedom of movement of all synovial joints, and they of course are your shoulder joint, the ball and socket joint of your shoulder, and the ball and socket joint of your hips, okay? So those are the major um, uh, ball and socket joints that, um, we are going to talk about, that we are going to discuss. In fact, they are the only ones in your body. Yeah, they are the only ones in your body. Pretty cool. Okay, so just to recap, we've got six different types of joints and they all exhibit different um, types of movement, okay? Different types of motion for synovial joints particularly, okay? So plane joints are the non-axial, have non-axial movement because they're just sort of slipping back and forth. Hinge joints are uniaxial movement because they move along a single plane. Your elbow is the biggest example. The elbow and the knee are hinge joints. They only go like this. They don't like, they don't go like side to side from here. This motion is happening from the ball and socket joint of your shoulder. You have pivot joints, which includes where your radius interacts with your ulna and is able to rotate so that you can rotate your wrist back and forth. The, um, the atlas and axis, remember C1 and C2 of your vertebral column, remember the dens, of the axis fits through the atlas, and that way your skull is able to rotate like this. That's also a pivot joint, okay? And that's considered a uniaxial motion because it's across one plane. It's only happening across one plane. Condyloid joints, like the ones, the um, metacarpal phalangeal, metacarpal something phalangeal, whatever. The one between your hand bone and your proximal phalanx, are condyloid joints and they let you, they're biaxial, so you can move both in this plane and in this plane, okay? So going this way and going this way, okay? And saddle joints, the example is your thumb, so they're kind of like condyloid joints in terms of them being biaxial, um, but they have a little bit more freedom of motion than a condyloid joint. 
and ball and socket joints, which are your shoulders and your hips. And they are multiaxial, the only multiaxial joint. Okay? So the types of synovial joints. Let's talk about a specific, a very specific hinge joint, okay? So a hinge joint, it's a synovial joint. It is therefore a diarthrotic joint, right? Fully movable. Um, and it is, as a synovial, as synovial joints go, it is specifically a hinge joint, okay? Which has a uniaxial movement. Um, and the knee joint in particular is especially complex as far as any joints go. Um, so we're going to learn a little bit more about it because you, um, we have so many injuries of the knee in general. Um, and I wrote this PowerPoint before I injured my own knee. So it's not just like me begging for attention. Um, there are a lot of knee injuries and you want to know all the parts that are going on in there. So the, uh, uh, the knee joint is actually three different joints happening in one single joint cavity, right? So remember the joint is enclosed in a joint cavity. You've got um, three different things going on. You don't need to know what three they are. The femoral patellar joint is, of course, the joint between your femur and your patella, which is your kneecap, right? It is a plane joint, so it's that non-axial slight movement right there. So technically speaking, between your femur, the distal end of your femur, and your and your patella or kneecap. Come on. Come here. Okay, so right here in between the femur and the patella. This is a plane joint. So there's only a little bit of slipping motion that happens here, okay? So that is non-axial um, slipping motion of a plane joint right there. That's one joint. In addition, you've got both lateral and medial tibiofemoral joints between the femoral condyles and the C-shaped lateral and medial menisci of the tibia, okay? So let's unpack that a little bit. So basically, whereas on the, so here's your patella, here's the distal end of the femur, here's the proximal end of the tibia, right? There's the fibula, fibula which is not involved in the knee joint, really. We've got this little plane joint happening between the end of the femur and the patella, but the big part of the knee joint is this um, medial and lateral uh, femorotibial joints, okay? So these are the other two, one medial, one lateral. Between these condyles, remember, of the femur, right? Lateral, uh, medial and lateral condyles of the femur, interacting with these little cartilaginous discs right here, okay? These discs um, are called menisci. Each one is called a meniscus. So we've got two menisci in each knee joint, and it's just a little pad that sits in between the condyles of the femur and those little sockets of the top of the tibia. Remember that don't that we didn't have we didn't name. Um, we just have the um, inter um, the intertibial eminence, I believe it was. So these little menisci are made of fibrocartilage, which again is for shock absorption, right? Good for compression. So all that jumping up and down and running around is supposedly going to be um, helped by these guys, but you can tear them. Um, and cause lots of problems with them. And since it's cartilage, they don't heal very well. Um, so you can end up with a, with a great big problem um, if you mess those up. So be nice to your, be nice to your little menisci of your knee. I'm pretty sure this doesn't, isn't gonna show the menisci. No, so here's an image without the menisci, okay? So there's no little cartilage pad being shown there but it is a good view of the, the planar joint, that sort of plane joint in between the patella, the femoral patellar joint right there, okay? So that's one, two, three joints that make up the knee joint, okay? 
Whew. All right. So recall what the general synovial joint looked like, right? And the parts that it had. It had uh, articular cartilage. It has a joint capsule full of synovial, uh, sorry, a joint cavity or synovial cavity full of synovial fluid. And it is surrounded by a joint capsule, okay? Some other things that are going on in this picture that we didn't see in the generalized synovial joint are the bursae. So we've got some bursae going on here, which is kind of cool. So here's one um, that sits right over your kneecap, which is pretty cool. One down here, so that's in between your kneecap and the tibial tuberosity, which is um, what you actually kneel on, right, when you kneel down. And then we also can see the, um, let's see, Ooh, we are, do see, uh, we see our meniscuses, our menisci, okay, so here's our lateral meniscus, it's our lateral meniscus, oh, okay, so we're only seeing this from a lateral view, so this is all the lateral meniscus, just chopped in half. You can also see some ligaments happening here on the inside of the joint, so these are some of those intracapsular reinforcing ligaments that we mentioned when we talked about parts of synovial joint, okay? So uh, this does resemble roughly the generalized synovial joint, but since this is a specific type of joint, the knee joint, uh, it's uh, a little bit more complicated than that, right? Okay, so this next image is basically if you're looking down on the top of the um, proximal end of the tibia, okay? So uh, this would basically be, If I isolated the tibia and we're looking straight down at it just like this, okay? So we're looking down at the top of the tibia right here. That's what we're looking at right here. We've got a um, meniscus, a medial meniscus on the medial side and a lateral meniscus on the lateral side. Um, this is the articular cartilage on the proximal end of the tibia right, the uh, proximal end of the distal bone, and then we also getting a slight glimpse at, again, those intracapsular uh, ligaments that hold this knee joint together. So this is just another view of the uh, menisci, okay, so you have a lateral and a medial meniscus. Uh, we also have a bunch of bursae, you don't have to know exactly how many. Mm -hmm. We've got um, muscle tendons that we will talk about when we get to the muscular system. I might mention them now, but you don't need to know them. Um, Professor, I have a quick question. Go for it. The bursa or the suprapatellar patellar bursa, does yeah. that have actual synovial fluid or is only synovial fluid in the synovial cavity itself? This, actually, this does have synovial fluid in there. Yeah, so all bursae, how are filled with synovial fluid and that's what makes them so like like i don't know like slidey or slippery how they can sort of like slip over each other or slip over the two sides of the sac does that make sense if you have, yeah like, so what is the distinction between the synovial cavity versus the bursa then so the synovial cavity is specifically the area in between the two articulating bones it's enclosed by the um the synovial capsule, okay? The knee joint doesn't have a really good defined synovial capsule on the anterior side, but it does here on the popliteal side. So on the back of the knee, you have a good um, synovial capsule going on here. But this synovial cavity is in between these two bones, and it's full of synovial fluid. The bursae are like separate little structures that are outside usually of the synovial capsule, and they're like their own little sac of uh, made of connective tissue and then they also have synovial fluid inside of them so that they can like slip around. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Cool, no problem. Okay, so uh, anteriorly the joint capsule is, it's, it's really hard to see, so they don't, they don't actually put it, I don't think, in this picture. This is not synovial capsule, this is actually the tendon that connects your quadriceps, your quad muscles on the front of your thigh to your patella. And this is gonna be your um, patellar ligament, um, which attaches your patella to your um, 
tibial tuberosity. So this is like over, um, this is basically the part where that you hit when you're doing that thing at the doctor where they, I don't know if they ever actually do this anymore. They test your reflexes by hitting this ligament, this patellar ligament with a little hammer, right? And then it makes you like kick your leg out. That's what they're hitting right there. So you don't actually see like an articular capsule or a joint capsule on the anterior side of the knee. Uh, you see it over back here on the popliteal side, but uh, not so much on the, on the posterior popliteal side, um, but not so much on the anterior side. That's just a knee thing. Knees are just weird in many ways. Um, and then don't worry about these so much. Um, we'll talk about those more when we talk about muscles, okay? Oh, and again, this is, this, just, this is exactly what I was talking about. So don't worry so much about this, but we will talk about these muscles of the quadriceps, this quadriceps tendon. Um, this is where I think I ripped my quadriceps tendon off of my patella, just saying. That's where the pain is, is right there. And um, yeah, the rest of these tendons and ligaments, um, I'm not gonna ask you to memorize those. Um, so don't worry about it. We'll get to the quadriceps tendon when we talk about muscles. Um, and the only other one that's really of great importance uh, is the, I mean, not, they're all of great importance, but whatever. To me in this class right now would be the patellar ligament, which connects the patella to the tibial tuberosity right down there. That's the one that they test your reflexes with by hitting it with a hammer. Okay. All right, what else we got? Capsular, extra capsular ligaments. Um, there are four of those that I do want you to know, okay? So they are um, part of the capsule, right? Obviously not anteriorly, since we don't really have an anterior part of the capsule. And then they are extra capsular ligaments. There are extra capsular ligaments um, that are outside of the capsule. The intracapsular ligaments are the ones that we kind of got a glimpse of back here. So looking um, at looking down at the head of the tibia. Again, we're looking down at the so here's your tibia. We're looking down at the top of it, right here. We can see our uh, menisci, lateral and medial, and then you can see these ligaments that have been sort of cut right here that pass through the center of the joint. Right. So these are intracapsular ligaments. They are the anterior and posterior cruciate ligament, okay? So again, this is the tibia. This is the tibial tuberosity right out front there. This guy needs to be rotated so that we're looking at the same view, okay? So this is the anterior side with the tibial tuberosity that is over there. And we are looking down at this, okay? <laughs> My brain is doing loop-de-loops right there, right there, little tuberosity. So the anterior cruciate ligament is on the anterior side of the tibia and the posterior cruciate ligament is on the posterior side of the tibia. Let's see what we get when we look at a, another picture, hopefully. Okay, right. So the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments are intracapsular and they prevent anterior posterior displacement of the knee joint. So basically they keep the femur and the tibia from doing like this kind of a thing. It holds them, holds one over the other, okay? So it kind of holds your femur over your tibia without it like going like this either way, okay? That's what those cruciate ligaments, intracapsular, right in between those two bones, they're keeping them together like that from the inside of the joint capsule. Okay. So they're actually, but they're technically outside of the synovial cavity. So the synovial cavity is like in between here and here, um, but not here technically. So it doesn't actually go through synovial fluid or anything. Um, they're just holding these two bones together. So here's another view. This is an anterior view. Basically what we've done here is we've taken the tibia, which was normally right here. We've cut that quadriceps tendon right here and then we have folded the tibia down and away from the rest of the joints so that we can see what's happening inside so we made a cut right here oops sorry we made a cut right here and pulled the tibia down okay so we pulled it away so we can see on the inside what's happening here so again here's our uh, menisci here's our lateral and medial meniscus 
Um, the lateral, of course, is on the same side as the fibula because the fibula is always lateral. The medial is on the opposite side. And you can see our anterior cruciate ligament right here and the posterior cruciate ligament crossing back behind it, okay? So cruciate as in a cross, okay? So they're crossing each other right down the center of that joint, right on the inside of that joint. The other two ligaments, okay? So that's two out of four, anterior cruciate ligament, posterior cruciate ligament. The other two are going to be these guys over here. So this guy here and this guy here. These are the um, fibular, or lateral collateral ligament, and this is the tibial or medial collateral ligament. Okay, so this is the um, this is the ACL right here, right? Um, I'm sorry, this is the, the anterior cruciate ligament is the ACL. This is your um, fibular or lateral collateral ligament, and your medial collateral ligament is on the medial side. And these two ligaments keep the bones from going off of each other like this, right? So the cruciate ligaments keep them from going over each other front and back. And the collateral ligaments keep them from going over each other side to side. Oh, okay. So that's your knee joint and what you need to know about it, okay? Which is basically, it's a synovial joint it has all of the normal parts of a synovial joint, minus like the uh, joint capsule on the anterior side. There really isn't really much of that. Not to say that it doesn't have a joint capsule. It does, it's just thin or absent on most images of knee joints. So it's got all the parts of a synovial joint. Uh, and, and then in addition, it has uh, menisci, which are pads of fibrocartilage in between the condyles, of the femur and the, um, the distal end of the tibia. And it has four uh, stabilizing or reinforcing ligaments that I do want you to know. And those are the anterior cruciate ligament, the posterior cruciate ligament, the lateral collateral ligament. I'll, ex I'll, inc I'll um, accept either lateral or fibular um, collateral ligament and the tibial or medial collateral ligament, okay? So two cruciate ligaments and two collateral ligaments, okay? Any questions about the knee before I move on? No. Okay, cool. Let's talk about, uh, since so the knee is a hinge joint, let's talk about a ball and socket joint, uh, namely the glenohumeral joint, which uh, as you may uh, deduce, is your shoulder joint, not just from this, but from this, because the glenoid cavity of your clavicle uh, interacts with the proximal, uh, the head of your humerus, right, to form the glenohumeral joint, okay? It is, again, a ball and socket joint, making it a multi-axial joint, whereas the knee joint being a hinge joint is a uniaxial joint, right? It only goes forward and back, it doesn't go side to side, thanks to those collateral ligaments. So the, um, you have that full range of motion being a multi-axial joint, but since you don't have like the, remember the, um, the structure of the bones in terms of the, um, you think about like, the hip joint and how you have that really deep acetabulum and the head of the femur uh, goes into that and creates a lot of stability. You don't really have that so much for your shoulder. Um, and part of the reason for that is to actually get more move freedom of motion out of your shoulder joint. So that stability that your hip joints have, which is like arguably much more important for your hip joints as they bear weight um, and stuff like that, um, that stability is less important for your shoulder joints. So it is sacrificed uh, in lieu of greater free freedom of movement. So you can like make a full circle in the sagittal plane with your glenohumeral joint, um, but you can't do that with your, um, with your hip joint, right? Um, some people can get very close, right? Depending on how flexible you are. 
um, but generally speaking. Uh, but that loss of stability does mean that you have a lot more dislocations with shoulder joints, right? Which you can, which you, you most of you probably know just anecdotally. Most of us know somebody who has dislocated their shoulder one way or another. Um, and that's because it has less stability. The stability that it does have is provided by ligaments um, and muscle tone, right? Just to clarify, we need to know the specifics of the knee and the shoulder. Yes. Oh. No, just the knee. I only have the knee on the study guide, right? I don't think I said anything about the shoulder on the study guide. I think it's just the knee. Uh, Anybody have it in front of them? I yeah, I, I do. I only, I only asked about the knee joint or know about the knee joint. Yes, it's be able to identify the parts of the typical knee joint. But not anything for the shoulder? No. Okay, so that will be just the parts of the knee joint. I'm going to show you this about the shoulder joint. Um, for your uh, for your information, being a ball and socket joint, I just think it's interesting, but you don't have to know the names of the structures for this, okay? So here's that glenoid cavity of the scapula. Here's the proximal head of the humerus. Uh, as a synovial joint, it's got those six things going for it, right? So it's got, a, uh, it's got articular cartilage in blue. It's got a, a joint or synovial cavity full of synovial fluid. Uh, it's got a joint capsule. So here's part of the fibrous capsule up here. Here's the rest of the fibrous capsule up here surrounding the joint. Um, and then in addition, it has bursae, it's got um, tendon sheaths, uh, and it's got uh, stabilizing, uh, reinforcing ligaments as well. But again, I'm not going to ask you to memorize those, just the four ligaments of the knee. So none, none of the ligaments of the shoulder, so don't worry about that. But here's kind of what they look like. So what we're looking at here is, let's see how fast I can do this. Scapula, isolate, go. Okay, so what we're looking at here is we're looking down the medial side, or sorry, the lateral side of the scapula. Is this the same, oh it is, it's even the same scapula. Okay, so this is this skeleton's right scapula. We're looking down the lateral side of it you can see the glenoid cavity. You can see the acromion process or, and the coracoid process. The acromion process, of course, is where the acromial end of the uh, clavicle articulates with the scapula as part of your pectoral girdle, remember? Um, and these are how these, all these crazy tendons um, stabilize this joint. So this is basically all that's stabilizing your shoulder joint. So you've got, um, yeah, a bunch of ligaments and tendons that are holding this all together. Um, and it's pretty remarkable, but that's really it because this is a very, um, a very shallow sort of um, articulation there for a ball and socket joint, right? That's all that's holding it together is all these uh, ligaments and tendons. All right, and then some basics about the elbow joint. Again, don't need to know any uh, specific details. Uh, the elbow joint is another hinge joint, like the knee, but it's not doesn't have all these weird complications that the knee has. You have the radius and the ulna, of course, articulating with the humerus, right, to form this hinge joint, which is a unilateral or a uniaxial movement, right? Has a uniaxial movement, one plane, formed by the trochlear notch of the ulna, which is that bottle opener, right, that U shape. That's the trochlear notch. Uh, which goes around the trochlea of the humerus, right? And that's like how your elbow bends right there. So this is like the outside of that bottle opener, right? So you only have flexion and extension only. So here is your synovial joint, hinge joint specifically, uh, elbow joint even more specifically, articular cartilage on both the distal end of sorry, the proximal end of the distal bone and the distal end of the proximal bone, which is the humerus. We've got a joint or synovial cavity full of synovial fluid. We have a joint capsule holding the whole thing in. The synovial membrane is in green here. Okay, don't uh, mistake that for a uh, bursa. This is just like the inner membrane of the joint capsule. Uh, here is a bursa full of synovial fluid, and that just protects um, the back of your arm right there, the, um, that tendon from your triceps, uh, brachii, 
from um, rubbing uh, too directly on this joint capsule, so from this ligament here. So you don't want this fibrous connective tissue rubbing against this fibrous connective tissue. So you have a bursa there. And a lot of people get bursitis of the elbow, right? So if that little bursa uh, gets inflamed, then you end up having elbow pain right back there, right? Okay, so this is like a really weird uh, image of the end of the ulna. This is the bottle opener right here. So this is that U. It just looks really big and weird in this particular picture. So that's what your shoulder joint looks like. And from the outside, not the inside, you can see, again, more reinforcing ligaments that I don't want you to memorize um, that hold this joint together and the other side. Okay. And then a uh, little bit about the hip joint, the other ball and socket joint as opposed to your shoulder, um, head of the femur and the, uh, the um, I keep wanting to call it the acetabellum, it's not, the acetabulum. Uh, good range of motion, but limited by the deep socket, right? So that stability um, uh, is, is kept at the sacrifice of range of motion, vice versa from the shoulder, which has a huge range of motion at the expense of stability, okay? Uh, don't worry about that. Question, actually, so sorry. Go for um, it. You know how, um, I don't know what's different in when I try to like download like that, um, the study guide. Uh -huh. um, you know how some, I like to like fill in the blanks, like yeah. in the answers through the computer. Uh -huh. Try to do it's that. Reading it. It's not, I don't know. It's like, I don't know what's different between. Are you, so you're using like Acrobat uh, to write, no. to write on it? No, usually. Or, or like a PDF yeah. reading program? Yeah, like I can usually download it and type it, you okay. know, but it, when I do do that, it comes yeah. paragraphs. I think I can, I think I can fix that. So what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll bring it into um, Adobe and I'll see if I can't make it read it automatically. So you can like put the check marks on it and like type on it and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So I usually, um, I just uploaded it as a Word document. Yes. Okay, that's what I'll do then. That would be amazing because I'll, I'll re-upload it as a Word document. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Study guide into Word. Make it a doc. Let's do it. Yep, that's a totally easy fix. I can totally do that. Thank you. No problem. So the last one of the um, of these, well, I'm hoping it's the last one of these major synovial joints examples that I wanted to go over uh, before we start talking about uh, muscle actions is the uh, hip joint, the, uh, so the acetabulum of the coxal bone is here. This is the head of the femur. We've got the, all different parts of the synovial joint that all synovial joints have. The articular cartilage, the synovial cavity full of synovial fluid, and then the um, synovial or joint capsule, the articular capsule, right, on either side. We have fibrous connective tissue. And then here is one of our reinforcing ligaments right, holding it all together. From the outside, oh, it has got a little bursa hanging out here between these ligaments. You can see that there are lots and lots of reinforcing ligaments for this as well. Um, trying to keep this, um, um, the head of the femur from ever leaving <laughs> the socket of the acetabulum, right? We definitely don't want that to happen. The next few slides are from um, the Pearson textbook. So these aren't from our textbook, but I thought that they were they would be a useful alternate um, for you in case you wanted to get a or see a nice chart indicating um, with pictures all of the different types of um, all the different joints in your body and the types of movement that they have. Um, so basically this is a chart telling you all of the different joints of the body, which bones are involved, the structural type, right? So fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial, and the functional type, the movements allowed. So this is one, this is a chart that's already been done that tries to sort this out, but it's, it's wordy and it's long. It's the equivalent, yep, it's the equivalent of table 9.3 on page 306 of your textbook. So on pages 306 and 307, you have a chart, which is all words and no pictures, 
telling you all the different joints of the body and what their structural and functional classification are. So this might actually be a really good resource for making your, your own color coded chart, right? So use this um, to color code your own chart with some of the um, major joints that we've talked about. So the knee joint, the shoulder joint, the elbow joint, um, the examples of the um, types of joint movements. So we talked about the non-axial planar joints, the wrist joint, we talked about um, condylar joints as the joint between your metacarpal and your proximal phalanges, uh, saddle joints, the joint of your um, metacarpal and your proximal phalanx of your thumb, pivot joint, your radius rotating with your ulna, and your atlas and axis of your head, which is what's actually shown here. It's your, let's see, atlantoaxial. The atlas and axis is a uh, pivot joint. So that's how your head is able to turn back and forth. Um, and uh, yeah, some cartilaginous, we've got our cartilaginous joints here, right? Oh, it's technically a synovial to sternoclavicular. So make your own little chart. You can use this. Again, here's all of the different joints of the body and how they are classified. But this is all the same information as the um, table 9.3 on page 306 and 307 of your textbook, which I could just pull up if I were thinking with my brain. I'm sure it's here too. Oh yeah, it's after all these movement stuff. Movement. Oh, so here's some nice pictures of different um, joint types and examples of those. 9.2. Okay, so actually, yep, selected joints of the axial skeleton. Yeah, so this is the same table as in the physical text. So it's also in the e text on the same. In the same place, figure 9.3 and 9.4, okay? Somebody, somebody's chatting with me, what? Lab 13, what page is it supposed to be turned in today? That is on the assignment, it is, uh, let's see, I gotta pull it out real quick. 11, 12, and 13. I think 11 is the spine, which is page 34 and 35. 12, I think, is the thorax, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, I'm, I don't know if I'm, if I'm mixing them up, but the spine is pages 34 and 35. The thorax is pages 36 and 37. And the skull is 28. The 33, 28 to 33 skull. So basically everything from 20, page 28 to page 37 are all of labs 11, 12, and 13. 28 to 37. And again, if you don't have the coloring book, these have been provided to you on Canvas, so you don't have to worry about this. 28 through 37 are labs 11 through 13. All right, right, so here's this cool chart that tells you a bunch of different examples of joints and their structural and functional classifications, which is nifty. Okay. <clears throat> so, for these different synovial joints that have, uh, that are different types, as in planar, pivot, condylar, hinge, ball and socket. All these types of synovial joints um, have, they can have non-axial, uniaxial, biaxial, or multiaxial movement, right? Um, and then they also um, are going to have their angular movements, which is basically the same, it's the same thing as the muscle action, okay? So these words that we're about to learn about the angular movement of joints, they also correspond with the um, muscle action 
of the muscle that actually causes that movement. Sorry about that, I accidentally bumped my computer. Okay, so again, these words of these angular movements of the joints also correspond to the muscle action of the muscle that's causing the angular movement, okay? So let's look at these so that we, okay, I'm just gonna, so these are, these are them, but we have a page for each of them. So let's just go into them, okay? So first thing we had here was gliding movements. We've got, um, so again, this is like plane joints where one flat bone glides or slips over another flat surface, okay? The intercarpal joints, again, the wrist joints, right? These are plane joints, they do a gliding motion. Intertarsal joints, joints, um, the bones of your ankle, between the bones of your ankle, again, Plane joints, P-L-A-N-E joints that do a gliding motion, um, non-axial gliding motion. And between the articular processes of the vertebrae, okay? So wherever your vertebrae are actually touching each other, those are plane joints and they do gliding movements, okay? So gliding movements are basically the movements of plane joints, okay? They are like this. That is the gliding motion of the plane joints of the of your wrist, um, specifically called the intercarpal joints. Okay. All right, angular movements. Okay, these are the actual motion movements um, that we think about um, when we talk about moving, like most of our arms and legs, right? As like separate from the little planar movements of your of your wrist bones, right? Our wrist and ankle bones are weird, chunky, short bones you know, that happen in our appendicular skeleton. But we do have um, all the angular movements of the rest of our limbs, right? Uh, namely, flexion, which decreases the angle of a joint, right? So this is like 180 degrees, 90 degrees, zero degrees, right? So that's decreasing the angle of the joint is flexing the joint. Okay, so that is in reference to a joint. You are flexing a joint when you're decreasing the angle of the joint, right? Um, but you can also refer to flexion as the action of the muscle that causes this movement, okay? So the muscle that's actually causing flexion of the hinge joint of the elbow is your bicep muscle, right? that's the muscle that's pulling, right? The uh, point of origin is over here, and the point of insertion is over here. This is what part that's moving. This is the part that's staying still. Flexion. The opposite of flexion is extension. So that would be increasing the angle, okay? Going from zero to 90 to 180 is extension. Extension. You're extending your arm, right? The extension, extension of that joint is this movement specifically, and there are mu the muscles that make that motion happen, right? It's not this one because muscles don't push, right? It's not pushing your arm open. Instead, it's the muscles on the opposite side over here that are pulling to cause the opposite movement, okay? So your bicep causes flexion and your tricep causes extension, okay, by pulling. You basically have a set of muscles for every joint and each of them pulls and when they pull, they do opposite things, right, because they're on opposite sides. So the biceps muscle flexes the elbow joint and the triceps muscle extends the elbow joint. Okay, let me know if that doesn't make sense. Yeah, I'm gonna take that as a yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so hyperextension is basically when you extend past 180 degrees, okay? Um, and you don't want to do that, obviously. So don't hyperextend your joints because that means that you're going past what they're designed to do and probably causing um, painful injury to yourself, okay? All right. So uh, you can also do this with your neck, right? You can flex 
using the muscles here. You can extend using the muscles back here. And you can hyperextend, which would probably be breaking your neck, which would be terrible, so don't do that. So um, flexion and extension can happen um, at a lot of different joints, right? It's not just an elbow joint thing, okay? So the elbow joint is just an example. Um, but flexion and extension can happen in a lot of different places. And the, the tough part is knowing um, when the angle, sometimes when the angle of um, the joint is decreasing versus increasing, or like which joint you're specifically talking about. So let me give you an example um, of where this can get confusing, okay? Then the biggest one is when we're talking about, to me anyways, when we're talking about the joint of um, of like your hips, okay? So like in this example, if we're talking about flexing the hips, then we are talking about like bending from like here and we're flexing these muscles here and, ex and the opposite would be extending using the muscles back here, okay? However, when we're talking about the upper leg, right, we're going to be flexing our glutes, right, our gluteus maximus muscle, and then extending using the muscles here at the front of the leg, okay? So you have to pay really, really close attention to what actual joint you're talking about, whether you're talking about bending like at the waist, which one is flexion, which one is extension, if you're narrowing or if you're shortening this angle right here, or if you're talking about the joint here and you're closing this angle here versus this angle here. So it can get a little bit weird, but as long as you know like specifically what joint we're talking about, um, then you can nail down whether or not you're increasing or decreasing the angle um, of that joint and therefore whether you are flexing or extending. The knee is an easy one, right? So you can, you can flex your knee or extend your knee, right? Flex and extend. Um, you can uh, flex and extend your wrist. Um, we already did the old neck thing. Um, as far as the rest of your body goes, there may be better um, descriptions of muscle actions um, and joint movements for those than flexion and extension. So let's talk about those here. Oh, okay, so I already kind of said that. So flexion of the knee joint, extension of the knee joint, flexion and extension of uh, really um, the joints of your um, pectoral muscles or um, the joint, the joint of your shoulder caused by the pulling of your shoulder, of your pectoral muscles, sorry. Okay, so flexion and extension can be applied to a lot of different joints and a lot of different muscles, depending on specifically what you're talking about, okay? And again, we're gonna talk about this more when we talk about the muscular system. Um, so just have this, you know, somewhere, you can tune it out if you're just like too overwhelmed by joints, that's fine, but know that it's here, um, this is when we're going to talk about this so that we can jump straight into muscles after the exam. So flexion and extension um, are big. There are, uh, there's a better term for certain movements, namely abduction and adduction, which is a really cool one. So abduction is movement away from the midline. Um, so like uh, usually talking about limbs, right? Since we're pulling away from the midline, it'd be really hard to do that with really anything else. Um, going, doing like this would technically be flexion and extension. Um, but when we're talking about limbs, going away from the midline and going back towards the midline, we're talking about abduction and adduction, okay? So that's literally just you're abducting your arms, like you've been abducted by aliens, right? So you're abducting your arms, and when you bring them back, you are adding them back to your body. So abduction, adduction. And you can do it with your legs too, right? You can move them away from the midline. So you can adduct your leg, 
and I'm sorry, you could abduct your leg away and adduct it back to the midline. Abduction, adduction, abduction, adduction. Circumduction is a combination of flexion, abduction, and extension <laughs> of um, your arms or your legs, but it's literally just doing this. So circumduction is like you're making a, you're building, you're making a cone in space. Okay, so you can do that with your arms and you can do it with your legs too, obviously. I don't need to like demonstrate that, but I did anyway. Okay, so circumduction is doing circular motions and you're like creating a cone in space, okay? All right, so there's our circumduction. Rotation. So that's basically uh, exactly what it sounds like. It's basically, it's rotating one bone um, across or over or within or around another bone, okay? So between the C1 and C2 vertebrae, your atlas and your axis, right? And the rotation uh, between the, um, oh, rotation of the humerus and the femur, okay. So between your atlas and your axis, right, you've got the dens of the axis goes up through the atlas, and this movement like this is rotation. That's a rotation movement, and it allows your head to do this, okay? Um, the rotation of the humerus and femur is literally going um, like going like this. And we're talking about the, the this arm, this bone here, the upper arm bone. Okay. So this rotation of the humerus, or you can uh, rotate your femur too. So I'm basically like pointing my foot like this. And that action for the femur to do is considered rotation. Okay. Okay. So again, turning the head or rotating the um, the femur, or you can also rotate the humerus. And if you're rotating it out, that's considered a lateral rotation. And if you're rotating in, that's considered a medial rotation for your arms and legs. Okay, supination and pronation are specific to your hands, okay? So your radius and your ulna, again, they rotate around each other, right? Um, so that you can do this kind of movement. This kind of movement has a name, and that is supination and pronation. So just as a body uh, may be prone on the ground, um, it'll be, you'll be um, face up, right? Lying on your back, lying prone. And if you're supine, then you're lying on your face, right? So if you are, so if you pronate your hand, you are rotating it like this, so it's face up. And if you are supinating your hand, you're rotating it like this, so it's face down, your hand, right? Okay? Pronated, supinated. Pronated, supinated. And that is the, that is caused by the rotation of the radius around the ulna. Okay. So there it is. Supine and prone. Supine and prone. Okay. All right. And then there are specific names for the movements of your foot as well. So um, I'm sure you're all dying to see my foot. You can see my dog. There's my dog. It's Jilly. She's guarding the place, apparently. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You come over here. Okay, so you've got plantar flexion, which is basically flexing the muscles of your arch of your foot. Okay, so you've heard of plantar fasciitis uh, when you have pain in the arch of your foot, right? So plantar flexion is when you're flexing these muscles here. So that looks like this. It's pointing your toe, okay? So plantar flexion and then dorsiflexion is coming back <laughs> from the flat, okay? Plantar okay. flexion, dorsiflexion. Flexion, dorsiflexion. And Jelly Bean is sleeping. Are you guarding me? Keeping me safe? Thank you. Oh, how cute. Thank you, my girl. <laughs> She's my best bean. How old is she? 
she's oh she's going on seven i wish she wasn't oh. she's going on seven. <laughs> oh. we got her from the orange county shelter she's super cute she's so cute she spoiled me she spoiled us both as a dog because she's so good Aww. and then we got our other dog and we were like i was just like crying every other week because he's such an idiot compared to her <laughs> she's so <laughs> smart it's like she can read my mind Oh, she's such a good girl. It's my special girl. Anyway, don't get me started. <laughs> so, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the foot. Um, and uh, so you got pointing your toe for plantar flexion and dorsiflexion is the opposite. And then you've got movements, the other movements of the foot. So plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, but then you can also, you can also rotate your foot, right? So you can, you can turn your, you can kind of rotate your foot medially, so like this, and you can uh, turn it laterally like this, sort of, right? So inversion and eversion are what those are. Inversion is inverting your foot, and eversion is everting your foot, just like that. And, oh, along the, transverse plane, protraction and retraction. This has to do with, I think really the jaw is the only really example that I can think of when this is applicable. Protraction of the mandible, okay? So you're basically jutting your jaw out forward, you're protracting it, and then you can retract it back, okay? So protract, retract, <laughs> it's like totally weird and creepy. I always think of like alien. It's like the alien can like protract its little like mini mouth out of its main mouth and it can retract it back in. So protraction and retraction are like highly specific and weird. And this is really the only example. Um, elevation and depression. Again, another jaw thing. So basically um, the lifting of a body part superiorly or the dropping inferiorly. And um, the best example of that is also your jaw. So you can elevate your mandible by closing your mouth and depress your mandible by opening your mouth, right? So you're elevating it or depressing it, up or down. And opposition of the thumb. So this is the most specific of all the movements because it's just a thing that your thumb does, which is literally just that the saddle joint of your thumb which gives you all of that cool rotational mo movement there. It's not technically rotational, sorry, I used the wrong word. It is a, a biaxial movement, technically, there, um, allows you to do this um, action here, which is called opposition. Opposition of the thumb is basically just being able to move your thumb and touch your other fingers. All right. Okay. <laughs> cool. So those are all of the uh, joint actions. We're actually doing really well for time. I know I'm talking really fast too, and I think part of that is because this lecture is so long. Um, so maybe when you watch the YouTube video, you can like uh, choose the option to slow it down. <laughs> if you have to do that, I apologize. That's sad. That's not good. I just didn't want this to go on um, forever and ever and ever, because um, it's long. So we got through all of those muscle actions. There really was there like a big part of the reason why it's so long, um, but I wanted to include them again because when we go over the muscular system, we're gonna be talking about those muscle actions and it's important to know this terminology of um, flexion, extension, uh, adduction, abduction, because the muscles are partially defined uh, by what they do, right? So your biceps brachii, flex the arm, right? Your triceps break, yeah, extend the arm. That's what they do. Um, so it's important to, to know this language. So now that we have that out of the way, and at least you've like seen it once, um, let's talk about some uh, joint injuries and diseases to wrap up today, okay? So some common joint injuries are of course sprains, uh, but then also cartilage tears not good, right? So when the sprain, when a sprain happens, um, the ligaments around the joint, so that can include like, again, these are all the reinforcing ligaments, right? So that could be lig ligaments that are part of the capsule, so capsular ligaments, 
extracapsular ligaments or intracapsular ligaments that are inside of the capsule, um, they get a little bit, they get stretched too far and they can just sort of like fray, stretch out and fray a little bit, um, or they can tear entirely, um, or they can completely rupture off of the bone, uh, which is worst case scenario and can only um, be fixed with surgery. So sprains are usually involving the ligaments, um, which are made out of uh, dense connective tissue, right? Cartilage tears are involved in the cartilage in the joints, right? So this is because of um, compression or shear stress. So um, if you uh, compress the two bones of a joint, of a synovial joint together, um, and then like shear them like this, you can dislocate or damage the um, articular cartilage, capping the ends of those bones. Or you can, in the case of the knee joint, um, tear or otherwise disturb the uh, cartilage of the um, menisci, right? So those little pads um, inside of the knee joint, if those get messed up and torn, then that really super sucks, right? So if it tears so much that little chunks come off of it, um, it can cause the joint to bind, to bind up so it won't be able to bend anymore. Um, and of course, since cartilage is uh, avascular, right, there's really no blood supply for cartilage. So it uh, has a really hard time repairing itself. So um, oftentimes, uh, cartilage injuries uh, need to be repaired surgically as well. Luckily, we have arthroscopic surgery now, uh, which lets them fix your knee through tiny little holes with like little tiny cameras. It's really cool. You should Google arthroscopic surgery, watch videos of it. It's pretty rad. This is actually probably a still from an arthroscopic surgery. So basically you've got one little hole that a little tiny camera looks in and then the other hole is where the doctor brings in the, um, the instruments and sort of watches a screen to see the inside of the knee joint <laughs> that he's working on and uh, repair this um this torn meniscus right so here's your here's that little pad of cartilage and if you tear it and little chunks of that come out of there then you need to go in and like re-smooth that basically you'll have to resurface that otherwise you're going to have that friction and it's going to cause pain and it's going to cause more damage which is no good uh, in addition to sprains uh, and cartilage damage you can also have full-on dislocations of joints right um, so when bones are forced out of alignment, it's considered a, a dislocation or a luxation. Um, you, if you have a full-on dislocation or luxation, then you're probably also going to have sprains and inflammation and joint immobilization. Um, because to, in order to pull the joint out of alignment, you're probably going to have to um, stretch or tear uh, those reinforcing ligaments, right? That's why they're there. They're trying to keep that from happening which is gonna cause inflammation, right? And then you're gonna end up like not being able to move it because it's so painful um, or because everything's so far out of alignment that it physically can't be moved. So it's usually caused by serious falls or by playing sports, you know, and of course people dislocate their shoulders all the time, um, playing sports and, and doing dumb stuff. Not that sports are dumb, but other dumb stuff. Dumb stuff or sports. How about that? <laughs> okay. And then subluxation is basically like a slightly less than a full luxation. Okay. So it's a partial dislocation of the joint as opposed to a full on dislocation of the joint. Okay. Sub below a full luxation. Okay. So sprains, cartilage tears, dislocations, and uh, subluxations. All right, so we also have, uh, um, so those are injuries, things that we can, we actually do to ourselves, but there are things that, um, that happen um, either degeneratively um, or that are not like so like specific in terms of injury wise. And remember I was talking about itis being just a term for inflammation of. So you can have inflammation of anything and it's really kind of a generalized um, terminology for like a lot of different conditions. It's really more of like a symptom. So whenever you see itis um, at the end of, of, uh, of a 
condition that somebody has. It's basically the doctor saying like, I don't really know what it is, but it's causing inflammation of this. So it's really just a symptom of something else. Okay. So bursitis is inflammation of the bursae, right? Like we talked about before, those little fluid filled sacs that help to um, keep your uh, ligaments and bones from rubbing up against each other directly. Um, and if you smack them real good, like if you smack the little bursa behind your elbow real good, then uh, you might end up having, uh, getting it, having it get inflamed um, and being really upset and having some pain and swelling there. And that would be bursitis. And, and you treat it with rest and ice um, and maybe some ibuprofen, okay? Tendinitis is inflammation of the tendon. So just, um, it can be the tendons or the tendon sheets, right? So the tendon sheets are just like the bursae, except they're surrounding the tendons. So if the um, tendon sheets um, get messed up, then you're gonna have problems with your tendons. Anyway, um, usually is caused by just by overuse. So um, doing like the same exercise over and over again, or if you like do a specific type of lifting or movement when you work, um, then you can end up uh, with tendonitis inflammation of your uh, tendons or tendon sheets. Um, and it's hard to tell the difference between tendonitis and bursitis sometimes because they're, um, they're all really like kind of in the same locations a lot of the time. So here's some of the stuff that um, is not quite so preventable. They are preventable um, sometimes, but arthritis, right? So arthritis is inflammation of the joints, right? all those arthroses, <laughs> arth joints, um, arthritis, inflammation of the joints. Uh, there's lots and lots of different types of arthritis. We're going to talk about three of those and you'll need to know um, how to differentiate between them or be able to describe them uh, symptom wise. So arthritis is the most widespread crippling disease in the US. So it's a problem. Uh, of course, the symptoms are pain and stiffness and swelling. Um, they can be caused by different things. Different types of arthritis are caused by different things or uh, any particular one type of arthritis can be caused by multiple factors, uh, which may include uh, bacteria, which can be treated with antibiotics, um, but a lot of them are mostly just like wear and tear and um, ticky pumpkins. Ooh. Yeah, thank you. Feed into the chickens. Okay. <laughs> Um, and, uh, um, so, okay, so acute forms as in ones that, like, come up unexpectedly and are super bad, super painful, those can be bacterial, um, in origin, and then uh, the kinds that kind of come up slowly and last forever, um, those ones are usually just sort of, like, from, like, wear and tear breakdown. So let's talk about a few of these osteoarthritis okay so as you might notice from the name osteo um it does uh involve um it involves the bones as well as the joints so this one um is the one that people just tend to get as they get older um it's irreversible and it's um degenerative so basically it's just wear and tear so at, over time uh the ends of your bones at the joints um, tend to wear down and that the cartilage, the hyaline cartilage in between um, the bones of the joint uh, tends to wear down and then you end up with pain or you end up with friction, uh, which then um, leads to pain and inflammation. Yeah. Okay, so basically in um, badly aligned or overworked joints, you have cartilage being destroyed um, and then the exposed bone after that cartilage is gone uh, gets thickened um, and it can get sort of rough. So you get bone spurs, which is like little sharp points on it. And as they like rub together and they like shred the tendons and ligaments around them and like just cause a mess in there, it's terrible. Treatment can involve moderate activity. So trying to like keep movement, but not the like intense activity that may have caused it by overworking them. But keeping movement is really important because you want to like keep the blood flow going in there and encourage it to heal as much as it can, right? You'll want to use mild pain relievers, maybe some topical uh, pain relief, 
Um, and then you can also supplement with uh, glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, which I had not actually heard of before. Um, but those uh, supposedly will help to um, at least um, stop or slow down the degeneration of the joints. That is um, not the same thing as rheumatoid arthritis, okay? So osteoarthritis is kind of like osteoporosis with bones. It's just something that happens to people when they get older, okay? So um, bones get thinner and in osteoarthritis, um, the cartilage gets thinner and um, eventually um, is deteriorated down to nothing and then the bones are rubbing against each other and causing problems. Happens to pretty much everyone. Um, that's different than rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which is actually an autoimmune disease, um, and they don't know what causes it. So basically, it's your immune system, for whatever reason, um, focusing on your joints and causing inflammation there. So usually it arises um, in like midlife, uh, but can happen at any age. Um, it tends to affect women more than men, and you end up with uh, joint pain. Oops. Oh, well, there we go. Joint pain and swelling. Um, but then also in addition, uh, the other symptoms of this autoimmune disease include anemia, osteoporosis, muscle weakness, and cardiovascular problems. So rheumatoid arthritis is not just um, something that affects the joints. It, it largely does, and that's why it's called an arthritis, but it also is accompanied by these other symptoms, um, which is going to be how it's going to be differentiated from osteoarthritis, right? So osteoarthritis is just deterioration of the joints. Rheumatoid arthritis is not caused by overuse. It's actually an autoimmune disease. And it also is accompanied by other symptoms, um, including anemia, osteoporosis, muscle weakness, and cardiovascular problems. Um, so it begins with inflammation of, a, um, of the synovial um, uh, capsule of the affected joint. So you end up with, um, uh, like I was saying, the immune response is going to be a first uh, infl inflammatory response, right? So you're gonna have um, in inflammatory blood cells are going to be directed to this area to um, heal or destroy pathogens, whatever your body thinks it's happening, right? Autoimmune means that your immune system is attacking your own body. Um, so you're gonna have an inflammatory response where you shouldn't in the uh, synovial capsule of your joints, of your synovial joints, that inflamed synovial membrane is going to thicken up and then it's going to start to rub away the cartilage in the joints, scar tissue emerges, and then the articulating, the articulating bones of that joint are gonna eventually um, hit each other, um, which is called ankylosis, is when the bones are actually physically touching in a synovial joint, which they never should, right? You always wanna have that synovial cavity in between full of synovial fluid and the articular cartilage in addition to keep those bones from ever actually contacting bone to bone. Um, but that's what happens in both types of arthritis, right? Osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. But the, um, the reasons for it are different. Osteoarthritis happens because of wear and tear and rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease and has other symptoms uh, on top of just the joint problems. So here's some uh, rheumatoid arthritis going on here. Actually, this might not be, this might be osteoarthritis. This is from, this is from some other textbook, but I was hoping that it was in this one too. I think this is just something that we can use as a generalized arthritis. I'm not gonna make you identify what type of arthritis this is, but these are kind of the effects that happen here. So what you end up with, is, uh, as you can see, we've got almost like full on, this is ankylosis right here, right? So you've got the bone touching the bone, um, as opposed to something like here, which is relatively normal, right? We want it to look more like this. Instead, the bones are touching and you have um, like scar tissue bone growth happening um, where it shouldn't, these sort of like malformed, mal-shaped bones. And eventually these joints will just be fused. They'll just be fused. Um, and they won't be able to move anymore. So they'll just get stuck in that position. Okay, to treat rheumatoid arthritis, um, 
there really there isn't much to be done. You can use immunosuppressants to suppress the immune system, um, but of course, doing that, you know, leads leaves you vulnerable to uh, any other infection, right? You want your immune system most of the time. Uh, you can treat um, symptomatically, so treat for pain and inflammation. So something like aspirin, ibuprofen, these things are going to uh, take down the inflammation and help with the pain. You can try to use antibiotics long term. That just sounds like a bad idea all around, honestly. Uh, but also keeping movement. So it's this kind of like like letting it stagnate and letting it get worse. Um, that's how the the joints will end up fusing. So you want to try and keep moving as much as you can, um, but gently, right? Not to cause any further damage. Um, and they are coming up with new treatments. So there may be a, a treatment for rheumatoid arthritis specifically later on to neutralize specifically some of the uh, inflammation response uh, that your blood cells uh, release, some of the inflammatory chemical chemicals that your blood cells release at the site. So that would be good if they could do that. Okay, the last type of arthritis, so um, is gouty arthritis. So we talked about osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and now gouty arthritis. Gouty arthritis is when you have a, uh, when you have uric acid crystals being deposited in the joints um, and they are causing the inflammation in the joints. Okay, so they're caused by these uric acid crystals. Um, this one is actually more common in men and it usually affects the joint at the base of the big toe. So that joint between the um, that number one meta metatarsal and the proximal phalanx of the big toe is where gouty arthritis usually starts. So that's why you end up with like this weird, um, oh, I don't have a picture. I bet we could find a really great nasty picture of gouty arthritis, let's see. That's nice of them. Look at these images. Okay, so here we go. So gouty arthritis usually starts like this. Oh, that's awful. How terrible. All this terrible like inflammation and um, like building up of scar tissue that causes um, all this swelling and pain. So here's like a cartoon image of like the uric acids being deposited in the joint and causing all of this inflammation here. So you can, um, so again, the bone ends are gonna fuse eventually, um, causing the joint to become uh, permanently immobile. You can treat it with um, special drugs uh, for gouty arthritis. I'm sure that just targets the uric acid. Drinking plenty of water and avoiding alcohol are going to help to dilute your, uh, your urine. So uric acid, uh, is something that we normally expel in our urine. So if we, um, so if you don't, if you're not hydrated enough, um, that may um, cause there to be more uric acid, like in your system, than there would be if you hadn't been flushing it out with lots more water, or um, if you are um, basically concentrating your urine um, with alcohol. So alcohol will like um, make it harder for you to expel the, these uric acid crystals. So it helps to drink more water. Okay, so that's what I have for you today on joints. Again, there was a lot more information on this PowerPoint than there is in the study guide, and I will re-upload the study guide into a, into a Word, as a Word file. I'll probably just upload it as a Word file as well and have them both there. Um, so just download the one that you prefer, and the, um, I will update that funky little joints assignment thing there. It's basically just gonna be that one page of the coloring book um, with the knee joint. It just shows the, uh, the cruciate ligaments. Um, so that ought to help. I'm hoping that that will help you. Um, I think it shows, it looks like it shows one lateral collateral ligament. Yeah, so you got one collateral ligament on there, but, um, that's pretty much it. I'm gonna make it worth the full four points. So it's a four points of extra credit. I know it's not a whole hell of a lot, but I'll, I won't make it due till the end of the semester or something. So 
just something for you to do if you want those four extra points since I didn't have a joints lab planned for the semester before. Thought maybe that'd be a good opportunity to um, put some, a little bit of extra credit in there. It will continue to be worth zero points because I don't want to mess up our point total on Canvas. Um, I'm not playing that game again. We're not doing that. So um, I'm just going to like manually see who uh, submitted and then add your four points at the end of the semester. And we've got our quiz here at the end um, of the week uh, starting tomorrow. It is on the appendicular skeleton. So don't forget to take that uh, opens uh, tonight at midnight and Sunday night as per usual. Here's your study guide. I will upload the doc uh, version. It'll be right here. Um, I'm gonna update the assignment. Going to oh see about maybe making a joint classification chart or giving you guys some ideas on how to um, sort out all of that functional versus structural joint classifications. Um, what else? What else, you guys? Ooh, after after today. On Tuesday, we're going to have a, uh, basically just gonna be a review session. So the 28th, I'm going to make into a review. So the lecture I have here is basically gonna be a review and catch up for our exams on Thursday. And that's just starting on Thursday, right? So they'll open on Thursday um, and then close sometime Sunday night, um, probably the usual time, 11.59, Sunday night. So you'll have your um, hour or hour and a half um, time limit on those um, and uh, but you'll have that whole window uh, to start your exams and you can um, since we have two the other nice part is that you can like do one one day and do the other the other day again I'm not going to be um, asking you to try to use uh, respondus no lockdown browser no webcam nothing like that so this is again honor system uh, be true to yourself um, and what you want to learn in this class um, I'm sure I'll have another opportunity to talk about that. And if you guys have questions um, before Tuesday and you're just dying to know, our little bones discussion up here uh, is, um, is kind of one-sided. <laughs> this is all of me and my little, um, little things, hopefully, to help you guys. So got some links and some files, a little bit of practice stuff, some fun stuff if you guys haven't seen, you guys haven't seen that. Um, Essential Skeleton is pretty sweet. We're gonna, I already, I already helped Vanessa out with that. So um, yeah, if you're having any trouble um, with anything revol uh, revolving around the skeleton or joints, this is a good place for it. Um, otherwise, we can go over it on Tuesday, but I will be back at 5.30 anyway, just in case you guys have pressing questions um, this evening. So that'll be in about 45 minutes. So that's 4.45 right now. Okay. Thank Anything you. Anything else before I sign off? I just have a quick question. Go for it. So. Just to clarify, today, lecture and the entirety of Tuesday's lab and lecture, they're just clarification yep. time? Yep. Q&A, office hours, review, bring your questions. Do your study guides over the weekend, and then whichever stuff is just like to just put a little question mark next to it and ask me about it on Tuesday. That'll be our time to, to sort that, sort through that. Okay, thank you. I always ask because it feels so weird not showing up to lecture, even though it's just like a question and answer. No, isn't it? I know. It's like, I don't, I, I, I'm glad that you guys asked me questions during the lecture. Um, I feel like there's, there's no way that I would not let you guys do that. And it helps me too, to like have that feedback. But it also like, doesn't really leave much for lecture time. So yeah, figure just like, it's the hardest part then is you guys having to figure out what you don't know 
And to do that, you really got to um, just keep keep re-downloading the assignment, the lab assignments, you know, and like copying making, or making multiple uh, printouts of them or whatever, using your iPad and, you know, <laughs> restarting, undoing everything and start again. Find out what is really holding you back, you know, and see if we can't like sort that out. Um, the questions at the ends of the chapters are gonna help you too. The question at the end of the chapter of the textbook and these stupendous, oh, I forgot to show you guys this, these awesome little resources in the Wiley Plus modules. Um, definitely check them out. Um, hopefully they will load for you or for anybody, for you or me or anybody, that would be great. But in the modules, I know I had mentioned this before, but for each chapter, there's a module. And at the end of each of those modules, you get adaptive practice. So check out adaptive practice and see, uh, let it tell you what you're not so good at, you know? Um, answer the questions, do their little quizzes, answer your questions, and then it will tell you like which parts that you're like struggling with and to study more. There's also little quizzes. There's also the assessment. So not only is there adaptive practice, which is more like sort of like an interactive kind of a thing, there's like straight up quizzes um, that you can take too. So take the quizzes and the stuff that's like really super confusing for you um, that you don't understand the answer to. And, um, you know, ideally you've read the chapter and it still doesn't make sense, then make note of that, write it down and, and ask me on Tuesday. But those are some good, good ways to um, gauge which parts you're, uh, you'll struggle with the most on the exam, right? You got you to... Gotta, Got to test yourself sometimes to find out what you don't know. There it is. So isn't that nice? How do you log into that, Professor? Wiley Plus? This guy? Yeah. Well, it's kind of like Canvas. Um, so we use all of our same information like our school email and our school i i contract. sent you guys an email way back have you not been using it you haven't been able to use it all this time i completely forgot about it oh my god <laughs> no it's I, awesome i was wondering you want this it's I remember free you got this for you guys for free it's awesome so this so wiley plus let me see if i can't dig up um a direct link to it that um for the login um what i think what it was was at first when i first had you guys log into it it was like a um there was a link that i'll find again and then there was like a um uh a, like a section number that is our section so if you never logged in i think you need that section number in order to find our specific section and get access to all of our stuff. Um, but if you it, did, you ever log in ever for the first time or anything? To be quite honest, I don't remember. Okay. I, I feel yeah, I'm I'd sure like, it'll tell you. Of, it'll probably kind of, tell you if you if you do or you don't. And if you don't, then um, hopefully you know which email you probably used, and you can just like reset your password with like forgot your password kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Right now, I have to log into like 15 different websites just for my daughter. So I'm um, like oh, everything's just meshing. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, I'm so sorry. And it's um, it's weird because it is so similar to Canvas. It's like the exact same like um, they did the exact same like design. It's like based on the same what framework or something. So um, this was sent in our inbox then, right? I could just look it should be, yeah, but it was a while back. I'll send another one because I'm sure you're not the only one. So let me send, let me send it in my wrap up email. I'll send you guys um, everything that I have on the link to the login page and the section number in case you haven't logged in yet. Um, and then hopefully it will ring a bell <laughs> about which login credentials you actually used. 
Um, but I, it, I don't think there's any restrictions on like changing your password or anything as long as you know the section number. Um, but it would be, it's, it'll be totally worth it. Yeah, to, to expend that energy. This, it's really, really cool. It's really good. It's good to have. You guys Thank will be you. very comfortable with it, especially if you um, if you stay in my class in the fall, because I'm gonna I think I'm just gonna use this and just do like the e-text, like not even require a physical textbook. Um, because it's just got so many great um, resources and it's not it's not that expensive. It's gonna be like 70 bucks. So that'll be include the textbook and all this other stuff. So I think it'll be worth it to do it that way instead. Plus it'll be saving paper, which is kind of nice. Yeah, so I'll remind you guys about that. Um, and that's it. That's all I can think of for you guys. So I'll be back at 5.30. I'll send you guys the password for the 5.30 Q&A. And if I see you, I see you. And if I don't, I don't. Uh, and I'll see you on Tuesday, hopefully. Okay? See you Tuesday. Uh, all right. See you Tuesday, you guys. Stop in my share and end in the meeting. Signing off.